uh, before story, uh, I think we'll, we'll add a couple more poems here. And this one is actually related to the story. Uh, a lot came up about uh, men uh, leaving women and walking out on their families and those kinds of things yesterday. Ho! Oh. <laughs> and, uh, and some luggage. There was luggage and baggage. Uh, so this is Rilke's addressing of that situation. Sometimes a man stands up during supper and walks and walks and walks a while further because of a church he's heard of somewhere in the East. And his children say blessings on him as if he were dead. And another man remains at home, lost in the dishes and the glasses, so that his children have to go far out into the world to find the church that he forgot. So do you remember our friend the ball carrier? No. no. <laughs> well, we're here to remind you. Do you remember how the old woman lived in the woods and she had a powerful medicine object? It was a ball. And she could send it out into the world anywhere she wanted it to go. And one day she sent it to the people of two wigwams to the, where the Menominee people were living. And a young boy found that ball and he tried to get it. And the ball led him just out of his reach back to the old woman. Do you remember that? Yeah. Do you remember how the boy fasted for 80 days in total, how he turned his face to the wall and was near death, and how the old woman revived him? Do you remember that? Yeah. Do you remember how she asked him if the Manadus had visited him, and they'd all come and granted him their power? And he said, yes, they had. Do you remember that? Yeah. Do you remember how she sent him on a journey? to meet a bad one across a roaring river, yep. to take that gold and that little marvelous bridge that that bad one had. Do you remember that? Yeah. Do you remember after some, uh, a little bit of trouble, the boy actually did get the bridge and the gold and how he headed back and how he collapsed under a tree and the old grandfather of the roots found him there and he carved a woman out of poplar and he set her there and he blew life into her and he had to rescue the man. Do you remember that? Yeah. And do you remember how the man eventually left her and she collapsed and turned back into a poplar log? And do you remember how he went on his way and he kept meeting women? He met a woman whose sister was a red-haired witch and he contended with her and how Woodpecker killed the witch, helped him kill the witch, and he gave Woodpecker the scalp. Do you remember that? Yeah. Yeah. And do you remember how he met another woman on a trail and she was crying out because a giant was destroying her people and was following her. And how Ball Carrier tricked the giant and beheaded him. Do you remember how he burned the giant's body with all the people in that, in that village? And how he shot arrows up into the air after blowing ashes that turned to birds and he made the dead people come alive again? Do you remember that? Yes. Do you remember how he met another woman and she also had a sister? And do you remember the race where he changed his shape from a wolf to a pigeon to a, to a crow to a series of hawks and finally to a hummingbird and he won that race and he dropped that woman right where she stood and he killed her little cannibal children in the cave. Do you remember that? And do you remember how he left that woman and he took to the road again? Do you remember that? And that's where we left them. Carrier wanders on the road again, takes the narrow paths into the dark places. His journey finally takes him to a place where in the distance he can see a hut. And as he draws near, he sees inside that hut a beautiful woman. And he comes closer. And as she looks out of the hut, preparing dinner, she says, welcome, ball carrier. 
I've been waiting for you. You look hungry. Would you like to come in and have something to eat? And Ball Carrier says, You don't have a sister, do you? <laughs> and she shakes her head, head no. And he comes in, he sits down, and he eats. They become husband and wife. And Ball Carrier is satisfied. And that longing inside of him no longer chews at his soul. And they have t three children, two boys and a girl. And he's contented in his life. And things go on like this for a long time. And one day, Ball Carrier is wandering in the woods hunting. And he comes to a, a deep ravine. And down in that deep ravine, down at the bottom, there's a, a valley with a lake. And at the center of that lake is an island. And as Ball Carrier comes to the shore of that lake, he notices that the island is half treed and half rocky beach. And out of the trees, the trees begin to rustle, and out of the trees... You know how trees rustle sometimes when something large is inside. Out of those trees came a great white bear. And Ball Carrier stood frozen in spot. Because he knew that great white bear was the king of the underworld Manados. King of those beings that resided in the deep, deep, dark places. And Ball Carrier took out his bow, laid an arrow on the string, and as he contemplated the distance, he could see that there was no way his arrows would reach that dark being that he knew he needed to kill. And so setting aside his bow and arrows, he knelt down on his knees, drew a great breath and blew across that water, a mighty breath, and the water began to turn white. He took another breath and blew once again, and that water grew whiter as it froze all the way across to that island, and he blew a third time, and that water froze so thick, so it was impenetrable. And the white bear, seeing the lake freeze in front of him, raced down, and with a mighty swat of his claw, he crashed into that ice and it rebounded. And he took his head and bashed it in there and bashed it in there and bashed it in there until finally nothing had happened. And that white bear, that creature of the dark, called upon the boulders that were resting at the top of the hill on the island and caused them to come crashing down onto the lake and they bounced across that ice like pool balls on a pool table, skittering across, making noises, but no cracks appeared, nothing appeared. And the white bear, knowing that something tremendous was afoot, that something tremendous had come to contend with him, called, called out across the land and called to the wood ducks. And the wood ducks flew in from the four directions and began flying in a circle and tightening that circle to a point where they had a tight, narrow spot before the white bear until the ice began to thaw. A little bit of water formed at the top and it grew darker and darker as it grew thinner and thinner and the white bear lifted up into the air on his hind legs and leapt up and crashed down through the ice until he had disappeared into the depths. And Ball Carrier knew then that he had lost his opportunity with the white bear. So he took up his weapons and began the journey home. And as he was climbing out of that ravine on a mountainside, he could hear rustling. And spying through the trees, he could see a great water monster, a great serpent, and once again desiring to kill this creature that was threatening his people, he took up his war club in one hand and reached out and grabbed hold of that water serpent with his other hand, bit his fingers deep into the flesh. And as he was readying his war club to strike this creature down, its skin exuded a poison. And that poison squirted up into the air and one little bit of the poison touched his tooth. 
and another little bit of that poison made its way down his throat. And immediately, Ball Carrier let go of that water monster, for he knew his death was imminent. Quickly making his way back to his hut and to his wife, he entered the hut and he said, Woman, my time is at an end. I am to die now. Call the children. And when I die, do not put me in the ground, but take me up on the hill over there to those trees and lay me there. And with that, Ball Carrier's last breath eased out of his body, his eyes closed, and the life left him. And when the children arrived, they grieved, they wept, and they took his body, they cleaned it. They dressed him in his finest cloak and carried him up to the hill and lay him on a bier. And they took his weapons. They took his weapons and carried them gently down to the hut and created an altar and they lay them there. And they mourned the passing of their father. And the story could end there, but it doesn't. Without Ball Carrier to hunt for them and to provide, Ball Carrier's family fell into poverty. There wasn't much food. They grew skinny. Their clothes grew ragged because new skins to make good clothes with weren't available. Things were pretty desperate. And one day, a band of strange Indians came, some men, some warriors, and their chief came. And they began to make themselves pretty free with Ball Carrier's family and with their few meager possessions. They kind of took up residence there in their lodge, helped themselves. And one day, the chief of that band talked to Ball Carrier's wife, and he said, listen, here's how it is. You can either give me your daughter to marry or I'll have my men tear down your lodge and leave you with nothing to die exposed. What could she do? She gave the chief her daughter to marry. And true to his word, he did send the men away and he took up residence there with Ball Carrier's daughter. He lived like that for a time. He'd hunt and provide for them. One day, near this time, Ball Carrier's daughter was out looking for berries. She came to a place in the woods where she usually found berries, and there she noticed there was something she hadn't seen before. There was a little lodge there curious thing. She walked up and she looked in the door of that lodge and in the rafters of that lodge she saw a little red bird. The red bird kind of made friendly gestures toward her, nodded at her, looked at her, seemed to invite her to come in. And when she did she saw that there was a feast, all kinds of good food laid out just waiting for her. She raised her hand up and the red bird perched on her finger. And she knew in her heart that that red bird carried the spirit of her father. So she had some of the food. And the next day, she brought her mother and her brothers to that little lodge. And they each came in and they greeted the red bird. They shook its little claw. And they had food. And this went on every day for a time. Now the chief one night noticed that his in-laws and his wife never seemed to be hungry at supper time anymore. They'd been starving when he met them, but now they just kind of picked at their food. He thought that was curious. So the next day when his wife and his mother-in-law and his brother-in-laws went out, he followed them secretly. He tracked him, and he saw him go into a little lodge 
and shake the little claw of a tiny red bird and start eating food. And so he too went into the lodge and he too greeted the little red bird shaking its claw and he too had some of the food. But that night, the chief didn't feel well and he grew sick and he took to his bed and nothing they did for him seemed to make him any better. He seemed to be getting worse and his wife and his mother-in-law were very worried about him. And after a time, after a few days, they ask, is there, is there, is, is there anything we can get you? What, what can we do to make you better? And he said, I don't think there's anything that'll make me better except if someone were to kill that little red bird and cook it up, if I were to have a little of that red bird's meat, I think that might do the trick. Ball carrier's sons were horrified. They said they would never allow that. But the chief grew sicker and the women worried about him more. And one day, ball carrier's wife went into that little lodge in the woods and she took that little red bird and she snapped its neck. And she brought it back and started to prepare it for the chief to eat. And the sons came up and they saw what she had done and they were enraged. The eldest son took the head of the bird and he ate it. And the younger son, he took the bird's heart and he ate that. And then both boys left that place never to return. So the two boys wandered the land, they also taking the narrow path, walking from this place to that. And as they traveled many, many days, they came to a place where they saw a hut in the distance. And they neared that hut. And inside the hut was an old woman cooking a meal. And they walked up, greeted the old woman, and she greeted them and said, I see, young men, that you're hungry and weary from your travels. Come in, sit down, have something to eat and let me give you a warm place to sleep. And so she prepared them a meal, a beautiful meal, simple food, and they ate, they ate well. And they went inside after the meal, growing sleepy from the food and the warmth, and lay down in the place that she had indicated, and they slept. And early in the morning, they woke, and carefully, lifted themselves up and snuck out of the hut and left that place. And the old woman rose, having heard the rustling of them leaving, and looked over to the place where they had been laying and noticed a glint. For on the bedding that they had slept was a golden color, a gold dusting. Curious, she reached down and tried to pick up some of that gold, and as she touched it, touched it, it drifted down into the ground. For those two boys carried the gold of their father, the eldest from eating the head of the father's bird, the youngest from eating the heart of the father's bird who had come to them. And they went out into the world. Meanwhile, at home, the home of the chief and the daughter and ball carrier's wife. Ball carrier's wife continued to cook that bird, making it savory and tasty. And she brought that fine stew to the chief. And the daughter fed him some of it. And he began to revive, ah, this is exactly what I needed. And as she fed him some more, his brow knit and he looked inside the pot and he said, wait a minute, there is something terribly wrong here. Where's the head? And ball carrier's wife said, well, why my, 
oldest son, my eldest grandson, he ate it. And as the chief looked in, he said, well, looking in the breast, where's the heart? I don't see the heart. Well, the younger brother ate the heart. And the chief, enraged, picked up that pot and bird and cast it out into the yard, stalked off in full vigor and health, for he had never been ill. And his desire to have that heart and that head, they were thwarted. Now, when Ball Carrier died, the ball he carried all that way began to roll. It rolled a long time, and it rolled a long way, and it rolled all the way back to the hut of the old woman. And when she saw that ball roll into her lodge, she knew that Ball Carrier was dead. And so what she did was this. She took a fox skin and she tied it around her waist. And she took another fox pelt and she tied that around her forehead. And then she took that ball and she sent it out to go back to the place where Ball Carrier's body was laid. And she followed the ball the whole way. When she arrived, she saw Ball Carrier, his body up on the scaffold. And the old woman leaned over and whispered in his ear, Ball Carrier, it's time to jump up and live again. Ball Carrier came to life. He rose up, blinked a little bit, and then he jumped down off that scaffold. He went with the old woman back to his lodge and he picked up his weapons the spear and the war club and the bow and arrows and then they left that place they went back to old grandmother's lodge and she said to him ball carrier many years ago i sent you out into the world to find a bad one to take some of his gold to steal the wonderful little bridge he had now tell me grandson did you get them? And Ball Carrier said, yes, grandmother, I got them. <laughs> Where's the gold, said the old woman. It's right here, under my left arm, grandmother. An old grandmother took a knife and she scraped along the skin of his arm, removing every bit of the gold that was there. And she said, this gold must go back into the earth. If it's left around on the surface of the earth, it'll be too easy for people to find it. And the people will grow weak and lazy. And so she lifted up one of her lodge poles and in the hole that was there, she put that gold and she sent it down deep into the earth where it would be difficult for the people to get. And she said, where's the little bridge? And Ball Carrier lifted up his right arm. And his grandmother took her knife and she scraped that bridge free of his body. And she said, this too must be put deep into the earth. For if it's too easy for the people to travel around, they'll grow weak and lazy and indolent. And so she picked up another lodge pole and she put that little bridge down deep into the earth where it remains to this day. And then she said, ball carrier, look over there. You see way over there? It's the lodges of your people, the people of two wigwams. Your mother and father, they're still there. Their hair is white, but they have not forgotten you. Go now and live again with your people. And so that's what Ball Carrier did. And he remains there to this day. This whole story, you know, there was a badger that lived there near the old woman's lodge. Mm. He witnessed the whole thing. 
And he took that story, he took it down into his burrow, down into the earth. That story remained down in that badger burrow for a long time, but one spring there were, there were really heavy rains. And that area flooded and the story was washed out of the badger burrow into the streams and into the rivers and down into the big lake, big lake Michigan. The whitefish people breathed that story into them. And they carried that story for many years, but one day a fisherman, he caught a net full of whitefish and he had them smoked up good. That's what gives this story its smoky flavor. And Ben here and I, we had a little of that smoked whitefish and the story went into us and now we've told you. you.